Back when I was applying to law school, I was a so-called splitter applicant. Not by choice, of course, but because I had a low GPA, meaning I was going to have to make up for it with a high LSAT score. And that motivation fueled me to get a 175 on LSAT test day itself. Today, I'm going to walk you through how specifically splitters should prep for the LSAT and apply to law school so that if you are a splitter, you can get an LSAT score that more than makes up for a lower GPA. To start with, let's place your LSAT score in the context of admissions as a whole. You've got your LSAT score, your GPA, your application essays, your resume, any interviews you do, any contact with the law school, letters of rec, all of that can play a role, but the LSAT score is still the biggest factor in the law school admissions process. Now, you've got four remaining LSAT test dates in 2024. You have August, September, October, and November. You could take the LSAT any of those four dates and apply to law school early enough this cycle. You could even take the LSAT in January or February. That would not be too late. Now, of course, the LSAT changed this year in 2024, the biggest change to the LSAT in over 30 years. They removed the logic game section and replaced it with a second scored logical reasoning section. The funny thing is, law schools do not care which version of the LSAT you take, whether you took it with the games before the change or without the logic games after the change. It's all the same to them. They just want to see the highest possible LSAT score out of 180 on your LSAT score report. Now, if you are brand new to the LSAT, you should know that it takes typically a minimum of two to three months and ideally five to six months to reach your fullest potential on the LSAT. Of course, some people can do it faster. If you can, that's great. Usually those who can do it on the faster side, more like two to three months, are those who have few, if any, other obligations. If you're working long hours overtime as a paralegal, it's going to be a bit harder to squeeze in the LSAT prep time, but you should use your splitter status as fuel, as motivation, considering that law schools weigh LSAT score more heavily than GPA anyway. Now, if you had an upward trend in your GPA, that of course is great to see. If not, you could consider writing an addendum or you could write an addendum either way, explaining what happened in undergrad, leading you to get that relatively lower GPA to begin with, but regardless of what your GPA was, whether it was low or whether it was pretty good, either way, the LSAT score is still the biggest impact you can have in your law school admissions chances going forward. It's kind of funny, isn't it, that your GPA is the culmination of roughly four years of undergrad and your LSAT score is just one day and that one day can play a bigger role in the law school admissions process and in your chances than all of undergrad combined. So when students ask me, should I retake a class from undergrad to make some marginal boost to my GPA? My question is, that's a ton of time you're putting in to impact one class from one semester of roughly four years of undergrad. It's going to have an impact of maybe one to 2% in your GPA, whereas your LSAT score will have a bigger impact than all of undergrad combined and it's a single day. And so wouldn't it be better to spend that time on your LSAT prep instead? you aim for the LSAT in August or September or what have you, you could take it once or twice, three times, it's okay. Law schools do not average multiple LSAT scores, but rather they only take the highest score. So let's say you give it your all to take the LSAT in October and then you feel it didn't go great. That's okay. Take it one month later in November and you're still applying to law school this calendar year to start law school roughly eight, nine months later, it's totally fine. Law schools don't care because they have no reason to care. All they're going to care about is the highest LSAT score you have on your record because that's what goes to U.S. News for inclusion in the ever important U.S. News law school rankings. And schools, of course, care about raising the LSAT score medians. And of course, law schools care a great deal about raising their medians because that's what attracts more applicants to the school going forward or it attracts more money from donors as well. So let's look at how you're going to prep for the LSAT if you're taking it, say, roughly four months from now. I have a framework for LSAT study plans called the Laser Approach to LSAT Prep at LSAT Unplugged. We create personalized day-by-day -day study plans for all of our students whenever you're taking the LSAT, and they're based on my Laser Approach to LSAT Prep. Laser is an acronym standing for Learning, Accuracy, Sections, Exams, and Review. And so let's say you're taking the LSAT four months from now, you focus on phase one, the L for learning, building a strong foundation in the LSAT, the different sections, and the different question types. 
That's month one. Month two is going to be focused on accuracy, drilling LSAT questions by type to better understand the proper perspective from which to view each section and each question type. For reference, there are roughly 15 different types of logical reasoning questions. Some, of course, are more important and more frequently appearing than others. For example, necessary assumption, inference, and flaw are the three most common ones you'll see, so you might want to devote a bit more attention to those when you're drilling questions by type. That's month two, drilling the A for accuracy. Then month three is S for sections, doing individual timed sections to work on your pacing. With standard timing, you're going to have 35 minutes per section. It's a pretty fast pace with which to solve roughly 25 questions per section. That's month three. Month four, the final month, is the E in laser for exams and endurance. You're going to ideally take at least 10 full-length timed practice tests, one or two per week at least, to build up your LSAT endurance, your LSAT stamina, so that ideally test day itself will feel like just another run-through. This is month four, your final month. Now, mixed in throughout the four months is the R for review, the last phase of the laser approach. I've developed a framework for the review process called the Socratic Review Method to make sure that you are fully extracting all the value you can from every question you get wrong and every question that you have difficulty with so that you can avoid making the same mistakes going forward because every question you get wrong is an opportunity to learn something new. So with this Socratic Review Method framework, you're looking systematically at every single element of the question, the argument, the question stem, and the answer choices, the tempting wrong answers, the unappealing right answers, leaving no stone unturned so that you can course correct for the next practice test you take or the next question that you drill because of course the LSAT repeats itself a great deal. It is a test of pattern recognition. And so when you look at the dozens of or at least LSAT practice tests, you will see the same question types, the same methods of reasoning appearing again and again and again. So if you get it wrong this time, you better learn the lesson so that you can avoid making that same mistake going forward. Anyway, folks, that's all for now. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.